Welcome back, everyone. Um, just a quick video today that I want to talk about uh, the rise of some of the early uh, members of our genus Homo and sort of how we got here after we diverged with our last common ancestor with chimpanzees and that kind of thing. Um, your ebook goes into a great deal of information about this, but I wanted to kind of touch on a couple of um, really key points. Uh, about the early humans, right? Um, one of the things that I want to talk about is uh, some of these early ideas, right? Um, again, Charles Darwin was was uh, uh, the first that really described natural selection and everything. Uh, I may have mentioned this before. One of the things that he did not talk about, one organism that he never mentions uh, in his in his first book on the origin of species, was human beings. Uh, and he didn't because he knew that it was kind of going to be controversial with the church. But 10 years later, um, he actually wrote this book, The Descent of Man, where he talks about um, human evolution. And he talks there about both natural selection and sexual selection, those kinds of things. Um, a lot of people today have some issues with some of the things that Darwin said in this that um, are seen as... Uh, frankly, kind of racist and stuff like that. Um, I, I, I'll defend Darwin a little bit here because I think that a lot of the language that he used in his day was not um, seen in the same light that it is now. And so talking about people being, you know, calling people primitive and stuff like that was just how people talked about it then, you know. Um, and it, it isn't something that, you know, we would be comfortable with today. But again, you know, you have to understand the time frame in which things were made. One of my favorite quotes from Darwin is that in uh, his book, he said that if uh, the inequities in our society be caused by our actions and not our biology, then great is our sin. And what he was saying there was, you know, when we look at, you know, the rich being over the poor and those kinds of things, that's, uh, uh, you know, it's very problematic. And he, and he was saying, like, this isn't genetic. We've chosen to do this. We've chosen to have children starving and this kind of stuff, right? Um, but so Darwin was the first one that comes along and says, you know, there's obviously an evolutionary history here that human beings have had, that we have changed over time, this kind of stuff, right? Um, and at one time, there was a real debate once this was understood and accepted about, you know, where sort of humans evolved. And Darwin said, like, look, the things that are most like us, right, chimps and gorillas, um, are found in Africa. And so it probably makes sense that we probably come from Africa. And if he thought it was controversial to say that we evolved, telling a bunch of white Europeans in the 1800s that they come from Africa holy shit did that piss them off a bunch right um they were not happy about that ideology right i mean these are these are slave owners and colonists like telling them that they are african in origin was very controversial um at, at around the same time too <coughs> excuse me um we discovered some of the first fossils that had been found um, uh, the, some of the first fossils that we found of, of sort of uh, pre-modern humans, and that was Neanderthals. We found them in the Neander Valley in Germany. And so at the time, that bolstered uh, the alternative theory that humans had evolved um, out, outside of Africa, probably in Europe, because Europeans were like, clearly we're the best, right, in the racist uh, notions of the day, like clearly we're the best, so we probably evolved first, and all other humans um, in Africa, in Asia, in the New World are sort of degraded versions of us, and that's why we're so much better than them, is what they said, right? Um, and that, that, again, was sort of bolstered by this early finding. But, of course, the reason that they weren't they found it in Europe and not anywhere else is because they weren't looking anywhere else. Like, nobody wanted to find it anywhere else, right? Uh, and, and we'll talk about, like, you know, sort of where, where this comes from, right? Uh, or where, where we started, you know, seeing this. So, for a very long time, um, the African origins theory was uh, not accepted and quite controversial. Today, it is accepted almost universally. Um, as I mentioned before, there's there's still a couple of holdouts. There's there's literally one guy, I can't remember his name. He's an anthropologist. He's like ninety something, but he's still like teaching, um, and he is trained to hold generation of students. He did his dissertation back in like the fifties, and at the time argued that different races of humans, again 
back then they thought race was genetic and not biological. Um, and even at the time, that was controversial among anthropologists. But uh, back in like the 50s or 60s, he wrote his dissertation about how humans evolved separately, like Europeans evolved, Africans evolved, Asians evolved, all of this kind of stuff, separate from each other, from earlier populations of Homo erectus, right? Um, even at the time, that was really controversial. And since then, he's like nobody publishes his stuff. It's all nonsensical. Um, uh, the government of China also argues that we have, that, that the Chinese people evolved separately than everybody else, right? For racist reasons, all that's BS, right? Um, the genetics, the archaeology, uh, the fossil record, the archaeological record, everything is really clear at this point that we did evolve um, it, at one time. Right. So a lot of this began to change um, in the early part of the 20th century when we started to discover new fossils. So um, uh, these two guys, Raymond Dart and Robert Broom, Dart discovered um, this, what's nicknamed the Tong child uh, in 1924. It's been assigned to the species of Australopithecus africanus. Um, and um, um, this was sort of one of these early finds. Uh, this was a juvenile. Uh, we've since found hundreds of uh, Africanus specimens. Um, but uh, this was one of the first things that, like, you know, he came across this and realized, like, man, there is some stuff here, right? And so he was he was kind of an amateur. He was actually a medical doctor and an amateur sort of uh, 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 fossil hunter. Um, but he found this, and it was a really critical find, right? Um, later on, in, in 48, we found uh, Paranthropus robustus. Paranthropus used to be um, an Australopithecine, like uh, Africanus is, but we reclassified them a few years ago just because of how different they are. They're much more robust forms, meaning bigger, thicker bones, heavier, right? Uh, Australopithecines are what we call more gracile, meaning that they're thinner and leaner and narrower bones and those kinds of things, right? Um, we are related to the Australopithecines much more closely and directly than we are to Paranthropus, right? But so these finds were some of these early ones, um, just, and there were literally only a couple in the early part of the 20th century that indicated that there was maybe an African origin. And that changed, that, that, that really got established uh, in the 1950s and 60s with Lewis and Mary Leakey. Lewis Leakey is uh, the godfather of biological anthropology. Um, he was a, uh, they, Lewis and Mary Leakey are both uh, British. Um, Lewis Leakey, I believe, was raised in Central Africa, uh, if memory serves me, in Kenya. Um, but nonetheless, um, he decided he he wanted he he accepted this African origin. He said, you know, there's been enough finds here, even though it's only a few. If you look at our nearest living relatives live there, it makes sense that we evolved there. And so I'm going to find, as he put it in the day, early man. Right? Uh, it's a really cute story. He and he and Mary were in the university together. And he was about to leave again for Africa um, to head to Ethiopia to do field work. And um, she worked in the library on campus and they had been dating. And like right before he left, he just comes running into the library and says, Mary, come to Africa with me and find early man. And that's how he proposed. And they got married and, you know, made some of the most significant discoveries ever and, and, and um, ended up um, their, uh, uh, their children and their grandchildren have also become biological anthropologists and have made really significant discoveries, right? So it's, they're, they're the royal family of biological anthropology, right? Um, and and they did find these really early um, uh, versions of the Australopithecines and Paranthropus and this kind of thing. And um, again, your book goes into a lot of detail about this, but I want to point out here, if you look at this this chart, this is a uh, uh, letter A there is actually a chimpanzee, I believe. Uh, and then uh, all the way up to letter N, which is a, a, a modern Homo sapien, right? Which my video is blocking a little bit, but you can see there. Um, this is, uh, 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 you see this very clear um, change in these skulls over time, right? That uh, what we've been talking about, that the brain is getting bigger, the brain case is getting larger, we're losing this brow ridge that we have up here, our teeth are getting smaller, our jaw is getting 
smaller or we have less and less forward prognition this 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 jutting out point right and so you can literally see evolution uh when you line these fossils up and it's important to note uh, one of the things that a lot of people don't understand is that they say well you know we're making all these assumptions based on just a few fossils we have thousands of these now right we have rooms and rooms and rooms full of this at institutions all over the world, right? Uh, the fossil record is really, really robust, right? And you guys are going to be watching a couple of videos um, about uh, this, talking about the missing link, which is a misnomer and a misunderstanding about how evolution works, right? A wonderful series from PBS that I'll be posting. Um, but so I just kind of want to show you these sort of all lined up that you can you can look at it and see these things. These are the different ones that I was talking about there, right? From um, uh, a chimpanzee to the Australopithecines to the rise of our genus um, of Homo. All right. So one of the big things about human beings, right, is that we are bipedal, which we've talked about before. We're the only bipedal ape. So why? Why are we bipedal? There's a lot of arguments about what caused this. And the truth is, it probably wasn't just one thing, right? This was uh, uh, something that we were pre-adapted for, as I mentioned before, that we um, have incredible mobility in our shoulders and our in our hips, and so we were already pre-adapted for this. Uh, this is why you know chimps, uh, bonobos, gorillas—they can all walk around on two feet. Um, chimps and bonobos do it more than gorillas. Uh, bonobos actually do it a little bit more than chimps as well, right? Um, but so we were, excuse me, already pre-adapted for this. So why? Probably because of a change in the environment. We argue. Um, some people argue that it was um, uh, about sort of presenting a, a thinner profile to the sun, right? The world's becoming hotter. It's becoming drier. Uh, trees are dying out. Uh, smaller trees aren't sort of growing. It's slowly converting into a savanna, a grassland where we were, right? Um, and so, um, you know, we can't brachiate anymore. We can't swing in the treetops, right? We've got to walk around. And walking upright is an extremely efficient way to get around. We're incredible walkers. If any of you do any backpacking, you know this. We can strap 40 pounds on your back and you can walk 30 miles, right? Over mountains and stuff, right? Um, we're incredible walkers and it's extremely energy efficient as well. Much more energy efficient than walking on all fours. And so it was probably to conserve energy. There's an evolutionary advantage. If you can walk upright, natural selection is going to favor you a little bit, right? Maybe you're presenting a thinner profile of the sun. Therefore, you're not going to be as hot. You're not going to get skin cancer as much, that kind of thing. Again, natural selection is going to favor that, right? Um, it, it, it also, as I mentioned before, sort of elevated our eyesight, right? It freed up our hands to gather things, to dig for things, to tote firewood, to all of this kind of stuff. Um, I also uh, have mentioned in other lectures about, um, you know, maybe it was because it encouraged us to be a more social unit. And we do know that, you know, while we like to talk about competition, 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 like Darwin did, in truth, collaboration is really the secret to uh, human existence, um, that we work together, that we live together, that we hunt together, that we share our resources, right? Um, collaboration, uh, I, I would argue, is more important than competition for human beings, right? No solo individual is particularly successful. It's those individuals that can work in a broader group that do best. Well, maybe by standing upright and again, concealing the genitals, concealing the ovulation cycle, Maybe that allowed us, uh, encouraged us to live as this social group and therefore be more successful, right? Um, there's also arguments um, today about um, what's called persistence hunting hypothesis. If any of you read the book uh, Born to Run, which was a New York Times bestseller for like three years or something, you might be familiar with this. For some years now, anthropologists have been arguing that um, for a long time, we said that we weren't meant to run. We were meant to walk, but we're not very good runners. But we based that on some really bad data. What we were looking at is people in modern societies who run. And when you look at runners, one study um, found in the Journal of Sports Medicine found that if you are uh, something like 70 plus percent of runners um, hurt themselves so badly while running that uh, that within any two year cycle, it's like 70% of them have to stop running because of injury, right? And so we looked at that and we went, oh, well, we're not very good runners. Well, we're not very good runners when you encase our shoes in these really heavy 
excuse me, we encase our feet in these really heavy shoes that put our foot at an odd angle and forces us to land on our heel instead of the ball of our feet, and we run around on pavement and this kind of stuff. We started looking at uh, foragers, and it turns out that there are some foragers out there that are still um, doing a persistence hunt, which is a hunting strategy that involves running animals down. So one of the things about us is, Again, as bi bipeds, we were very efficient walking, but we're also very efficient running. We also have some other evolutionary advantage that like um, we can regulate our own breathing, right? And so you can control your breath, whereas a lot of animals when they're running, when their legs like come together, they exhale and when they spread apart, they inhale, exhale, inhale, back and forth. They will hyperventilate if they run too much. Well, you and I don't have that, right? Likewise, it has to do with how our brain is like, uh, like actually attached to our spine and how our eyes work that um, we're able to like run and move our head independently. Some animals can't do that. If you look at pigs run, they have this real floppy head thing because of their biology. So we have these like sort of pre-adaptive advantages to running. What some forager peoples do is that when there is, when they spot game, they literally run it to death. Um, how this works is that they will, you know, sort of pick an animal and start chasing after it. Now, of course, that animal is going to run, and of course, that animal is probably going to outrun us, right? You want to talk about, you know, gazelle or you know, deer or you know, whatever, um, four-legged hoofed undulates. Um, that thing's going to outrun us, but the truth is, it's going to get tired very, very quickly because it can't regulate its body temperature the way that we can, um, and it's not as efficient, right? So it gets tired and it stops, and we catch up to it, and of course, that spooks it and it runs. And we keep running, we catch up to it. But every time it runs, we're getting a little bit closer before it runs because it's trying to rest. And um, at some point, it just cannot run very far. And once we do this enough times, it literally can't run and the humans just run up to it and cut its throat, right? And so this has been documented by anthropologists more than once. Um, and so, um, you know, maybe that was it. That, that again, we talked about this need for uh, uh, new food sources and dense proteins and omega-3 fatty acids and all of this other stuff that we got by hunting and eating animals. Maybe that was the evolutionary advantage that favored bipedalism, you know? Maybe it was something else. Maybe it was all of these. Maybe it was a few of these, right? And so there's all of these different mechanisms that we see that are coming into play that probably have a bearing on this, right? So, uh, and again, there's strong evidence of this. Uh, I mentioned before, right, the way like our head sits upright. And so chimps, while they can walk upright, the truth is they're, they're, um, the socket where their spinal column goes up into the brain, right, is way far at the back of their head because they're used to being on all fours and then having their head so they would face forward sort of like your dog does, right? And so it's very difficult for them. They can walk on two feet, but it's very uncomfortable because their head isn't really meant to be at that angle, right? If you look at uh, um, uh, syn <laughs> synanthropus, excuse me, um, it's a little bit more forward. If you look at us, it's all the way forward. It's literally at the bottom of the skull. Like we are supposed to be walking upright. It's why when we're on all fours, we got to hold our head at this weird angle and it hurts our neck, right? And so even in our uh, the fossil record, we see this evolutionary transition into upright walking, right? Um, the first really dedicated were probably the Australopithecines or Australopithecus, right? Uh, these are the first hominids, the first in our sort of group, um, the, the first sort of humanish, right? This is Olduvite Gorge in Ethiopia, uh, which is uh, sort of mecca for biological anthropology. This is where uh, some of the most important discoveries have been found. There's some argument that we probably evolved in this area as well, right? And you can see it's a pretty arid area now. It was a little bit more moist uh, back in the day, uh, to uh, you know, a couple million years ago. But nonetheless, right, it's not this heavy, uh, heavy forest uh, environment like our ancestors had lived in, and so it became more arid. And so we were probably, you know, needing to walk around more, right? Um, when we look at the Australopithecines, and again, we've so many of these now. Um, uh, one of the things that we see is that their fore limbs are longer than their hind limbs, right? 
um, because they were still very closely related to these tree climbing uh, primates, right? Um, they have an arched foot, which uh, doesn't sound important, but that arched foot is indicative of the fact that they were walking around, that they were bipedal, right? Um, uh, chimpanzees, bonobos, and gorillas do not have an arched foot like we do, right? Uh, there was also some sexual dimorphism with them, with the males being slightly larger than the females. Um, for the longest time, we classified all of these as australopithecines, but we broke them up into two now, the gracile forms and the robust forms, right? So um, the, the, the oldest that we have found is about mm, four, four and a half million years ago, right? Um, but you've got, uh, and this is, uh, by the way, how you can write these, right? That A, the, the genus and species, you can shorten the genus with just the first letter, which is always capitalized, right? But Australopithecus, um, Eminensis, uh, Afarensis, and Africanus are, are the sort of earliest versions of this. The, the robust forms used to be Australopithecines, now they're Paranthropus, right? So Paranthropus boisei, which was discovered by Mary Leakey, uh, Paranthropus robustus, right? They evolved a little bit later on uh, as these bigger, heavier um, uh, organisms, right? Um, quite famously, um, um, when you look at um, uh, uh, the pelvis, you also see evidence for upright walking that the where the hips connect and everything um, are, are very different. This is one of the most famous um, um, anthropological finds in the history of the world. Uh, Donald Johansson in the 1970s uh, discovered um, this uh, Australopithecine um, in uh, Kenya. Um, this is her skeleton on the left there. And while it's not complete, it tells us a tremendous amount of stuff because, as I mentioned before, humans are bilaterally symmetrical. And so um, we only have half her pelvis, but that's okay because we know that the other side is just a mirror image of that. Like, like what makes more sense, that it's a mirror image or that she had a third arm growing out of her hip? You know, and so this is only 40% complete, but um, it was really important because that 40% tells us a ton about it. We've also discovered other uh, Australopithecines since then, right? Um, so uh, um, um, you can tell, again, this sort of evolutionary shift from chimpanzees uh, on, the, on the far right there uh, over to humans through Lucy um, as, as our, our hip becomes very, very different. Uh, in order to facilitate uh, bipedalism, right? And ultimately, uh, as you've read about in the book, the 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 the, uh, uh, the genus of Australopithecus ultimately gives rise to the genus of Homo, to which we belong. The earliest form was Homo habilis, who had what we often call these uh, Oldowan tools, right? Which were these very crude, very large kind of um, chopping sort of tools, you know. Um, um, that, that, that are the earliest examples of uh, tool construction and tool use, right? Um, there's debate about some of these of, of exactly when Homo habilis becomes Rudolfensis and stuff like that, but nonetheless, right? Um, Homo erectus, though, is, as I've said, probably uh, uh, one of the biggest, most important, right? Uh, Homo erectus uh, was from East Africa, but spread all over the continent, spread into the Near East, spread into Asia, um, down into what is now Southeast Asia, China, all over the place, right? Um, uh, 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 almost two million years ago. Um, this was a very well adapted organism uh, as evidenced by how many different environments they were able to live in. Um, they also had tools, the, the Achillean tool tradition is a little bit more refined. It's sort of smaller flakes that are used to do more sort of delicate cutting than these big kind of chunky rocks that just have one edge on them. And um, Homo habilis was using them to crack bones open and eat the marrow, which is a very, very calorie dense, um, you know, uh, food source, you know. But uh, Homo erectus was a little sharper, you know, he's a little brighter and, and he and she um, started using these these smaller flakes to do more delicate work of, of carving these animals up and butchering them and these kinds of things, right? We also know that they had fire use. I've mentioned before, we don't think that they had the controlled use of fire, though we may be wrong about that, right? We're 
we're still open to more evidence, but um, we do find evidence of, of fire use. And so they're butchering animals and cooking them, right? They're able to move into cold environments because they have a fire to keep warm, right? These kinds of things and, and to keep predators at bay and stuff like that, right? Uh, Homo floriensis is one that, uh, again, it's kind of new. It's the so-called hobbit. Um, it is a cousin of ours. We are not descended from this. Right. Uh, we are descended from Homo erectus, but not uh, the hobbit. Uh, this is a, a case, as I mentioned before, of island dwarfism, where the organism is very, very small because it had a, a, a very limited reef resources, right, like key deer uh, and that kind of stuff. Right. Homo neanderthalensis, right, uh, which is actually their, their fully official, like their genus, species and subspecies is Homo sapien neanderthalensis. We are Homo sapien sapien. Right, which means wise man, right? Um, and and we're so full of ourselves, we are wise, wise man, <laughs> right? Uh, but this is kind of the classic caveman, and then you can see this picture there, right? Um, is that they, you know, they had a smaller brain, they were shorter than us, but they were thicker than us, right? Um, much bigger, like brow ridge, larger nose, which was uh, facilitated them living in a cold weather environment because. Uh, Europe at that time was still in an ice age when they evolved, um, and so from Homo erectus. Um, and so um, uh, the, the broad nose allowed them when they were breathing in this cold air, which would actually damage your lungs, it's so cold, uh, by having this really large nose, um, broad and big, it allowed, when they were breathing in, it gave the air time to actually warm up before it entered the lungs, right? Larger shoulder joints, broader rib cages, they had bigger hips than us. Um, they had shorter forearms than us, right? But again, that's probably a cold weather adaptation to conserve heat. Uh, all of their bones are just bigger and thicker, right? They were muscled, thick, large uh, versions of us. But again, they're versions of us because we were able to interbreed with them, right? Um, and finally, you have Cro-Magnon, uh, this sort of uh, um, really, uh, truly modern human, um, both biologically and behaviorally that comes along, right? So as I said, I just kind of want to give a quick video kind of hitting on some of the uh, uh, important highlights there. Thank you guys so much. I'll see you next time.